Coming up, an interview with an artist that is on the short list of the greatest singers ever. I'm talking the very short list. This legend killed it with every band that he was in. In fact, he's one of a few artists in rock history to sing and write a top five hit with four different bands. Today, he tells the story of a song that was so atmospheric, the band, they drug all their recording equipment out in the middle of a field at night in the moonlight. It took hours to get everything hooked up. I mean, this was in the 70s, so it was very difficult. Uh, this singer nailed it in just one take. He tells the story of an amazing rock track, a classic, coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember Underoos, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. I had some Spider-Man ones. Make sure to subscribe below right now to get the latest and greatest interviews and the stories behind the songs. Also, check out our exclusive content on Patreon that helps us to keep it a daily channel. So I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, where featured artists go deep on their greatest songs and albums. Today, we're giving you more of an interview that I recently did with one of the greatest singers in rock history. Robert Plant, Freddie Mercury, Ann Wilson of Heart all say he is their favorite singer. Talking about the legendary Paul Rogers. Today we dig into his history right after he obliterated radio with his band Free. All right now, baby, it's all right. After that, he formed Bad Company. He did this with former Mott the Hoople guitarist Mick Ralphs, free drummer Simon Kirk, and former King Crimson bassist Boz Burrell. And actually, uh, Bad Company were managed by Peter Grant, who of course also helmed uh, Led Zeppelin. Bad Company ruled rock radio throughout the 70s with classic rock standards like Can't Get Enough, Can't get enough for your love. I can't get enough. Feel Like Making Love, like love. Rock and Roll Fantasy, Shooting Star, and their band's theme song, The Badass Bad Company. Bad company and I can't deny. Their debut album, it's just an all-time rock and roll magnum opus. This song, uh, Bad Company, was sort of a theme song for the band. And outside of the TV show, The Monkees, there's no rock band had ever really done that in such a, a serious way. Always on the run. In fact, the song was so atmospheric, so chilling, and so cool, the band wanted to swing for the fences. They wanted to add something really haunting to it. So they left the studio. They actually drug all their equipment to a secluded field in the middle of the night underneath the moonlight to record the song Bad Company. I was born six gun in you have to remember, this was the early 70s. It was not an easy thing to do. This was before technology uh, had accelerated. It took like hours. By the time it was all ready to go, it was early in the morning past midnight. In fact, the band said it took three hours to set it up with wires and lens and everything sticking out. Then Paul Rogers just walked up to the microphone with the cool breeze behind him, nailed it in one take, just one take. Man, his voice is just phenomenal. And there's actually two stories about where this song, at least the title of the song, came from. And Paul's going to tell you. Coming up next, he'll tell you the legendary song, the story of the song, and his other big ones with Bad Company, as well as some more insight into his first solo record in years, Midnight Rose. Paul Rogers, he had a top five hit with four different rock bands. Can you name them? Try it in the comments below, and then later in this interview, we're going to list them. We'll see if you get them right. Try that right now. It'll be fun. When we get into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. You know, i become uh, something of an eyewear aficionado because of Zenny. Uh, I love having assorted pairs of glasses, different looks, different colors. You can do the same thing without breaking the bank. Click on our info button right up here to get your perfect look can actually try them on before you buy them, seeing how you look online. Uh, very quality price as well. Check it out today. Just click on the link. Here's Paul Rogers. You actually put together a band after free short-lived called Peace. 
Then you put together Bad Company with Mick Ralphs from Mont the Hoople on lead guitar, uh, Simon Kirk on drums, and Boz from King Crimson on bass. Just a, a phenomenal band. Tell me about how that came together from Peace to Bad Company. I was touring with Peace, with, with Mont the Hoople. Peace were touring with Mont the Hoople. But anyway, we had a tuning room. And we used to tune our guitars in this room. So there was, guitar, there was amps in there and guitars. And you'd go in and tune. So I'd often meet Mick back there. And uh, he played me some songs. And I said, I guess you guys are going to use that song. It was Can't Get Enough For Your Love. And this, he said, no, it's not really Mott the Hubble's type of thing. Okay. So I said, well, give it to me. I would love to sing it. So we started a conversation and that developed into us becoming a songwriting team, which then led to the band Bad Company, which is the way it often starts, I do think. You know, basically it's the songs. Around this time, there was a rumor that you had been asked to join Deep Purple after Ian left. Well, yes, they did ask me and I was very flattered and they're, they're, they're a great band, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I thought I was in the fledgling stages with Bad Company at that point. We were at, at, out in the country writing songs, Mick and I, and we were looking towards a band. We were just looking for a name right at that, that point. And uh, so I declined, you know, because it wasn't the right moment. Mm -hmm. Well, Bad Company started with a bang. I mean, the self-titled record is one of the best rock albums, especially for a debut album. Top five smash right out of the shoot with the first single, Can't Get Enough. Well, now take whatever I want. Recorded at Headley Grange where Led Zeppelin was doing physical graffiti, and, and that's so cool. So much history there. Peter Grant was now our manager, right? So he called up and he said to me, Led Zeppelin are delayed for 10 days. So if you guys get in there, you can put a couple of tracks down. And I said, 10 days, right? Mick and I, was, we went straight in. We put everything we had down. And we made the first Bad Company album in that time. I mean, Led Zeppelin were fantastically supportive of us. And Peter Grant was too. We had the run of the whole house. So to give us this time was really important to us. So there was a kitchen and there was a, there was a hallway with stairs. And there was a great big living room with a big log fire going on in there. There's all kinds of rooms everywhere, bedrooms galore. And so we'd set up, we'd put the drums in the hallway and the guitar in the, in the big fire room and the vocals up here. And that's the way we worked. But we were so, you know, we'd rehearsed so much. We were so ready to record this that we put everything down. And um, I just, I remember each of the tracks. I remember little bits of, of moments. Uh, and I remember, can't get enough of your love. It was just... It was fantastic, you know. Well, you had such an incredible feel for that song. I mean, the vocal breakdown in the song's coda, it's classic Paul Rogers, so powerful, so soulful. It sounded like you just had an incredible feel for it. Well, I, I did. I knew that song was a hit. As soon as I heard it, I said to Mick, that is an absolute hit. You've got to, you know, we've got to do that somehow. Well, Bad Company, the song, such an incredible rock track. You teamed up with Simon Kirk for that one. And some have described the song as a, a rock and roll Western, especially yeah. in the first act of the song, so to speak. Company. That's a very interesting description of it. I think it is. You have to bear in mind it was written in the middle of the co English countryside. <laughs> Six gun in my head. What happened was I saw this advertisement for the first movie uh, called Bad Company. There was these four, four or four or five, you know, riders, like obviously, like, you know, wild guys, wild cowboys. And there was one of them uh, was pointing a gun like so at the, at the camera, I guess. And it, it opened out in a great big cannon. So it looked like you were looking down a cannon with these guys around it. And I, I thought, wow, that's fantastic. I'm going to write a song called Bad Company. So I sat down at the piano and started to work on that. So all of a sudden in my mind, I was completely elevated. Oh, whatever it is you do. I went to a different place. I was in the Wild West. <laughs> and, uh, and then Kirky came around and threw a few lines in for me, which was really nice. And we had bad company. And then I called Mick up and said, because we were in the habit of calling each other up with names for the band. 
And I said, bad company. And he went, that's it. The name of the band. Bad company. And I can deny. Also, I heard that it came from your childhood days as well. You saw a book. Well, I- yes. Well, actually, it did trigger a memory because the last time I'd seen those two words together, bad company, was in, uh, there was my best friend, Peter Smith, had this this Victoriana book that no one ever read, right? And I'll flick through it one time, and it had these pictures in it of, um, I think they were like Victorian morals, you know? This was, this was how you'd be good, right? And so there was a picture of this, um, I, mean, I guess you'd call him a Victorian punk, because he, he was dressed sort of like a gentleman, but everything about him was rags. You know, his top hat was popped up like this. Uh, he had a vest on, like a waistcoat. What do you call him? You call him vests. Um, and he had a suit on, and a, a chain, and a uh, watch chain in his pocket, like between the two things, and all the gear. But it was all very, very scrabbly and rough. And it said there was a little. He was leaning on a lamp post, which is a lamp post. It's a. He used to have the old lamp posts in the old days. He's you know, he's smoking this pipe like this. And there was a little, like, choir boy looking type of kid with his hands behind his back, looking up at him like this, like worshipping. And it said, Beware of bad company, you know? And I, I just remembered that. And the, the two things combined, I thought, Oh, yeah, I've got to write. That's why I thought, Must write a song called Bad Company. <laughs> well, it's interesting to come out as a brand new band with his own kind of theme song, you know? I guess it worked that way for us, although it wasn't really planned. It's just the way the cards fell, you know. There haven't been too many songs like that, that but it came out on the debut album. I always get chills when I hear that opening piano riff in Bad Company. That section seems like it came from the heavens. It's just incredible. It's, it's meant to be evocative of like wide open spaces and lots of lawlessness and prairies and you know all that kind of thing which perhaps we won't see again but who knows that guitar that mick created that's just another brilliant touch on that song and the bass too do 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 we love boz but it was very much a, a jazz musician when he didn't play rock he played jazz we always we just used to take the Mickey out of him for his jazz leanings, you know, like Coronation Street. Da 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 da. We go, oh, boy, stop it, you know. Uh, but he, he did swing, you know. He had a really good swing, and he played the bass in a unique way. It was like lead bass, and then it was down down the bottom, you know. So it was it was uh, covered the whole neck with his playing. It was great. Now, I've read that you recorded the vocal in the still of the night in the middle of a field under the moonlight. Yes. And it took three hours to set it up, wires and leads and <laughs> everything. Well, you see, you can, it's all right putting a mic out there, but now you've got to have cans and everything. So, so yeah, we'll set it up. By the time we got it all set up, it was like, you know, you had to, you had to walk across the field with cow shit in it. And <laughs> <laughs> so but, but you have to write you know you have to get into the groove and and like okay give me the music let's go you know let's forget all that stuff setting up let's get the music you know and it, you had to put yourself into the frame of mind that would deliver the song really basically yeah it's like a method actor you were a method singer you were a method singer out there vocals it was so cool though to hear about that you did it in one take though after setting it up in three hours yeah, there was a little wind that blew at the end, like whew, went right across the mic. And I thought, and I'll, try, I'll use that straight away, you know. What was the cold wind blowing? Yeah. They don't do that anymore, man. That's so cool. And the song was like written in like 10 minutes is what I read that pretty much. Well, you know, 10 minutes, it's, it's, it doesn't take long to actually write the song, but it takes a long time to percolate it and be ready for it and for it to come out. You know, when you actually do it, it doesn't take long, but to get there can take a while, you know. So many great covers of Bad Company from a wide variety of different artists. Tori Amos. And 
Garth Brooks, Five Finger Death Punch. And it's just interesting that this band and this song, that you've had so much influence not only on rock and blues, but, I mean, Garth Brooks is is a country legend, a country icon, to, and Five Finger Death Punch uh, metal. And, you know, and so it's just had such an effect on all these. It's captivated so many. One of the finest examples is how Stephen King quoted it in uh, the Dark Tower series in 2004. Did he really? He did, yeah. <laughs> Know that. I was born with a six gun in my hand. He says that came from the song. Wow. Great. Isn't that cool? <laughs> yes. Cool. Indeed. I think your new album, Midnight Rose, is on par with some of your best stuff. There wasn't actually a plan to make an album. It wasn't a big, like, let's make an album in capital letters or anything like that. It was just, let's go in the studio and have fun. And that's how it started. Um, we recorded a whole bunch of tracks. The bed tracks were put down locally here, uh, here in uh, BC. And then we took it to Brian Adams' studio in Vancouver and brought on board uh, Bob Rock and Cynthia started to produce. She was doing a bit of production with the with the core tracks, but she got really serious with Bob Rock and a brilliant job. And we actually, at that point, we, we put Chuck Lavelle from the Stones and the Allman Brothers, we put... He played keyboards on two of the tracks. Jimmy Mattingly from Garth Brooks Band, uh, who played violin and viola on a couple of tracks. Keith Scott from Brian Adams Band, he's just brilliant. Played on all but two of the tracks. And we got from Colin James Band, we got um, Johnny Fierro played a little sax on one track. Leslie Page, she's a beautiful singer. Uh, I met her when Bad Company played with Joe Walsh. We did a tour of America. And she was one of Joe's backing vocalists. There was a lot of people involved in the album from the from the core band, you know, Rick, uh, Todd, and Ray, and myself, to all the way through all those great musicians. Uh, they really have produced this album. I mean, I've let them, you know, they've they've done great things with it, uh, uh, and I'm very proud of what they've done. The title track is very poignant. I was curious about the title track or where that came from. Midnight Rose, Midnight Rose, well, pulling someone out from an environment or a position that they were not flourishing in, loving them and having them flourish. I'm sure she would spring to life. Yeah, I love the lyrics in it. It's, it's, it's a poetry set to music for sure. All the stars in the sky, in the heaven above. Well, Photo Shooter, tell me about that one. That's an interesting song. Photo yeah, well, a photo shooter is about the the idea of a, a photo shooter. You can put him anywhere, depending on whatever you need the story to be. I was thinking it could be a great TV uh, theme tune. And so, you know, yeah, it's where the action is. That's where the photo shooter, you'll find him. It might be fashion. What inspired that? That's interesting. I, I take everything as an inspiration, really, basically. So it could be something that you, you read in the news or a newspaper or you see on the TV or somebody says or you overhear somebody saying things. So you, you, I sort of compute everything and try to write songs about life that, that I see, you know. By the way, Paul Rogers wrote and sang a top five hit with four different bands. He's one of the only artists in the history of music to do this. Here they are. The songs and the bands are All Right Now with Free, hit number four. All right now, baby. All right. Electric Land with Bad Company that went to number two on the rock charts. I'm just a Radioactive with The Firm, his collaboration with Jimmy Page that hit number one on the rock charts. Radio, radio, radio. And Laying Down the Law with the band The Law. That hit number two on the rock charts. The keeper on the beat. Make sure to leave us a comment about Paul Rogers and Bad Company and his incredible music, his new album, uh, we'll link to it below. You got to get this new album. It's really good. Again, Paul Rogers not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's a joke. 
uh, bad company. He should be in with bad company and free and solo and don't even get me started. Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We would love to have you as part of our community. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.